Three scenes in this garment, one garment I wear Three leaves on the shamrock, from the soil that I tear Three joints in my finger, one finger is there Blessed Father, Son, Spirit, yet one God I serve The three are the one, and the one is the three um, Tonight is just really going to be a continuation of the last talk I did, I think, in July. And we're going to continue with the theme of Scripture and Union. And um, I was going to talk a, a little bit more about uh, the translating work that I've been doing in the last 12 months, but I feel the Spirit leading me to talk more about um, some of the issues that we're confronted with as we try to... Um, uh, address problems with the current translation and move towards um, a better option. I mean, I, um, I will say that there are other people around the world who are endeavouring to do the same thing, namely uh, one person that I've been in communication with from South Africa by the name of uh, Francois de, uh, de Toit, and he's actually doing a translation which he's entitled the Mirror Translation and he's following along the same theme and my hope is, is that other people will be inspired by the Spirit to write a translation of their own in the same theme of union rather than uh, sin defined as separation. Anyway, well, um, the topic that I really want to address tonight is the Latin heresy. And I don't know if any of you have heard of that and um, I'm just going to move over and get some books. I really want to encourage every one of you here and well around the world to get a hold of this book. This is really um, a fantastic resource. We've got them available on the, we on the website at a really great price of only $30 where they're selling up to a $90, $100 elsewhere. This is invaluable. This is really what uh, the true nature of repentance is all about. Now, we've got the wrong idea about repentance. It's um, rendered from the Greek word metanoeo. And we've got meta, which uh, literally means a change, and noeo is to do with the mind. So really, repentance is about changing your mind. And it's something that happens after the event, not prior to, event, to an event. So biblically speaking, when we rep repent, it's usually as a result of some sort of encounter that we have with Christ. We encounter Christ, then we repent. Yet we've been taught that we need to repent and then invite Jesus into our heart. So really the nature of everything that Torrance talks about is repentance in the true nature and spirit of its meaning. So I highly recommend how to read T.F. Torrance. It really is um, uh, an overview of all the work that Torrance has done over the last um, 30, 40 years, summarised into this book. Uh, and I use this book as a resource whereby I read through the information, I think, well, I like that, and I go down to the footnote, and it refers me to the particular work that Torrance has undertaken and I endeavoured to go and uh, purchase that book online and enlarge on that particular topic. And that's what I've done over the years, is I've gradually got uh, everything I could get a hold of of T.F. Torrance. And this is really helpful. It's like a Bible for Torrance's work. And the other three books that I highly recommend is The Mediation of Christ. This is somewhere um, good to start with. And I think this was the work that was done towards the end of... Uh, T.F. Torrance's life, where he summarised everything into this one little book. It is absolutely fantastic. I find it's probably the easiest of reading of all of his books, and it really can lay a foundation of, you know, um, I suppose, repentance, knowing what we have to change our mind from and to. And uh, these two books I find very helpful, Trinitarian Faith by T.F. Torrance, and the Christian Doctrine of God. They are heavy reading, but I think if you uh, take it progressively, beginning with this book, which can give you an over uh, overview of T.F. Torrance's work, through to the mediation of Christ, 
And you know, when you start to get a, a grasp of what T.F. Torrance is on about, then these two books would be the next step and on to all of his works. If you can get a grasp of what he's on about in these three, in these three or four books, then you're well under, on the way to understanding um, Christianity from the premise of union, which is what we're on about tonight. Now... blank page, that's no good. This is what we need to get a grasp of. There is no such thing as pure scripture. I've heard it many times behind the pulpit that this version is the only version that you can read. This is the most accurate version or that version is the only version that you should be reading. It's the most accurate. It, it all depends on, I suppose, as the uh, preacher is trying to get across his message from his own point of view as to whether or not the Bible will fall into line with his point of view. But there is no such thing as pure scripture, only translations. Only translations. So what you have is a Greek text which is what I'm trying to work from. You have the translator or the translators. The NIV is, is a translation which is a product of the work of a whole lot of translators. And they try and agree with each other as to how a particular text um, should be uh, translated from the Greek to the English and how the sentence should be structured so it fits in with their ideas. So it really depends on what is going on in the mind of the translator as to the type of Bible they will end up with. All right, that's very important. Whatever Bible you have is, is the best attempt. Now, and I'd say that, that translators are doing it with the utmost of integrity based on what they know. Okay, to come up with uh, a book they believe that closely reflects the text. But some uh, translators will say that they translate the Bible without theology. That's rubbish. When you get into the Greek text right, and you understand the Greek words in the context of the Greek sentence, which is uh, with the view of trying to share the Christian message how can it not be a theological experience? It is deeply theological. Uh, it, it, theology is God work. That's basically what I mean. A theo, God, logos work, God work, or the word about God. Right, so all attempts to translate is a deeply theological experience. Now, we have to take into consideration when we look at translations, what is going on in the mind of the translator? Uh, what is their premise? What is their bias? What, is the, what are the reasons as to why they want the Bible to be rendered in a particular way? So we have to understand the world view of the translator. And with many of the uh, modern translations, what we have is a modern world view attempt to translate the Bible which will reflect in their theology. Right? So their theology, how they understand theology or the th theology that they find acceptable to what they want to teach behind the pulpit perhaps or, or, or in Bible studies and everything like that will strongly determine the theology. And in theology we have Calvinism and I'm pretty sure that most of you understand uh, the theology of Cal uh, Calvinism, which is uh, largely structured uh, around the doctrine of predestination. We have five-point Calvinism. Uh, and it basically, it, it, uh, it's a determination of who will be the elect and who will be saved before the foundation of the world. Uh, and then we have Arminianism, uh, which is a free will doctrine. That can have a huge influence on how Bible translations will be rendered. Then we have a combination of Catholicism, Anglicanism, Lutheranism. I mean, I've 
I've been involved in all three t- churches and I find very little difference. Very, only slight differences in what they're teaching. They all have a premise, they all have a bias uh, and they all have a way that they want to convey the Christian message. And then in, I find in all of these cases that it usually begins with sin to find a separation from God the, or the sin problem. Now we go back to the ancient writer, right? We have to ask the question, what is his world view? Talking about the, uh, the ancient uh, Greek Christian. What is his world view? That's very important. What is his theology? And what was their bias? I find that in looking at the Nicene era, the bias is ignored. It's largely ignored. And of course we know their bias is union. Right? So if you have somebody who is invest- investigating the history of the Christian church uh, and they have a bias of separation uh, and they start to investigate the Nicene era and read some of their writings, uh, they're going to find union. And what's going to happen? They're going to distance themselves from it and say, well, oh, that's probably Catholic. Well, it is Catholic. It's Catholic in the true sense of the word. But because quite often you find that the uh, Protestant uh, believer will, uh, will be strongly sus- suspicious about anything Catholic and it's vice versa as well. And the Catholic believer may have strong suspicions about the Protestant group. So the bias of the modern translator, which includes myself, imposed onto the ancient writer. Well, I endeavour not to try and impose my beliefs on the ancient writer, what I endeavour to do is try and become a student of the ancient writer because uh, from my studies I find that the ancient Christian writers were students of the scripture and they made themselves students of Christ. But what we find in many cases in, in, in my dealings uh, with uh, many parts of the evangelical church uh, is that the ancient writings that conflict too much with the separation bias are regarded with suspicion. And they immediately, especially the Nicene Council of 325 AD, they immediately point a finger at Constantine. Uh, and they say, well, Constantine... Um, headed up the council and because of what Constantine believed then everything that happened at the council was disregarded. But he only chaired the council. It is believed that they had the 2,000 delegates at the council and he sat at the back and allowed the council to convene and to come to their own conclusions and when they came to their own conclusions well he ratified it as the chairman. Now, to the modern world view, the Nicene era presents many problems. Uh, it's separation as the filter, premise and bias through which all theology is measured against much of the richness of the Nicene period is overlooked. It's very unfortunate. Just disregarded. They hadn't got it right yet, might be some of the comments. They haven't evolved enough or matured enough in their Christianity are some of the comments that you get from many of the evangelicals, generally speaking. Not all of them. The theme of union is the bedrock of the Nicene faith which appears heretical to the modern world view. 
Right? So when we look at union from the point of view of the Father and Jesus in union and of the same being or commonly referred to as the same substance I'd rather say being because it's more dynamic substance just seems very static but when we say same being it really is dynamic it talks about an overlapping of beings between the Father and the Son and, and they might say oh yeah yeah I can accept that but then when you say that the Father, in the incarnation the overlapping of being between the Father and the Son overlapped onto our fallen humanity that's when people start to get nervous and they start to retreat and go no, 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 no so they have a different world view and that's really the heart and soul of the Latin heresy right, is they've failed to understand that not only was there an overlapping of things between the Father and the Son, but the Father overlapping the being of the Son also overlapped the being of fallen humanity and brought fallen humanity into themselves. So they fellowshipped with our fallenness, our depravity, our sickness, And then you start to go, whoa, you're going a bit too far now and start to retreat and move away from that. But that, in, in a nutshell, is really the, what the Latin heresy is all about. So what happens, and I've explained before, right, is you have a worldview, you have people who have decided for themselves according to their reflections of um, scripture, you know, they have defined themselves righteousness. Uh, they brought their dualist worldview to the Greek manuscripts. They brought their ideas of limited atonement, that Jesus came to save only the elect, while the non-elect are damned to hell. So they come. They can come to the manuscripts with that idea. They have their own definition of sin, which. Um, Many Hebrew scholars say that we are too superstitious about our idea of sin. That we've gone too far with it. Faith and belief, they make up their own ideas of faith and belief, hell and separation, wrath, holiness. They've all decided you know, to, amongst themselves, from ideas which I believe they've retrieved from a Caesar type God not God the Father as we see in Jesus Christ but a Caesar type God so you know, we, um, we have to go to this Caesar type God and would beg for mercy ask for forgiveness and it just depends what whim the Caesar God has as to whether he'll give you life or condemn you so the church by and large have adopted this Caesar type uh, mentality. They've determined righteousness now, according to a Caesar God. Holiness is, you know, is, uh, ignores the nature and character of God, the unique nature and character of God. That's what holiness is about. All right. um, the wrath of God they see something that as something as uh, the angry side of God, right? But it's, in reality, it speaks about the disposition of God. If you look up the word uh, wrath and do a word study on it, um, it you come up with the Greek word orge, or org, uh, and what they'll say it is describes the disposition usually a bad disposition but what we need to do when we look at terms like that is we need to bring Jesus Christ into the picture uh, if we see Jesus Christ as properly reflecting the nature of the Father who's nothing but loving kindness we see a loving disposition that's the disposition of God it's not an angry God who wants to vent his wrath and fury on the sinners no this is the God whose disposition is nothing but love and light and is nothing but a God who desires fellowship 
And he wants to bring sinful humanity into fellowship. No matter what the cost. So that's just an example how um, when we look at terms, right, we need to include Jesus Christ in how we in decide how we're going to render each of these Greek terms. When we ignore Jesus Christ, we take the Caesar type God view of wrath and say, well, God is angry with all the sinners. Does that make sense? Right, so it's whenever we translate, Jesus needs to be the subject and content of every single Greek word we translate. Jesus must always come into mind because he has come to us and face to face with those first apostles and those apostles have seen him, recorded him and gave us the scriptures so that we can stand alongside them and see him like they saw him with the view that we will change our mind about God. So that really needs to uh, have full weight as we endeavour to translate from the Greek to the English. And I'm telling you that when we do that, it paints a whole different picture of what those first apostles or the writers were trying to communicate to the known world at that time. They are truly, really trying to show that The face of Jesus Christ is also the face of the Father. Jesus came to us as loving kindness, as grace. That's who he is. And he came uh, in as the full representation of the Father. There is no other God behind the back of Jesus. We see Jesus, we see the Father. Jesus expresses to us nothing but the loving kindness of the Father who wants nothing but fellowship and he wants to draw the whole of humanity throughout the whole of history into their fellowship. Now we move on to the Latin heresy. But firstly we'll just be reminded of what is central to the Nicene theologians. The unassumed is the unhealed. I'm sure you've heard of that term. The unassumed is the unhealed. And this is what Athanasius says. To know the Father through his incarnate Son who is of the one and the same being as God is to know him strictly in accordance with what he is in his own being and nature as Father, Son and Holy Spirit which is the godly and precise way. Okay? If we want to know the Father, who do we look to? The Son. If we want to know the Spirit, who do we look to? The Son. The Father points to the Son and says, listen to him. The Holy Spirit takes from the Son and gives it to us. Uh, And he is saying the same thing. If you want to know me, if you want to know the Father, look to the Son. The precise and accurate way of knowing God. Central to their theology is union. Embracing Union, loving union. Nothing but loving kindness. The giving of their entire selves without giving themselves away. They don't hold back. We're the ones that hold back. God doesn't hold back. Now, the Latin heresy is, I found, easy to understand, but it can be complicated to explain. Right, so, at 
Yen, if you've got questions, don't hesitate to ask. Okay? So the incarnation is a redemptive atoning event where Jesus in himself fills the gap between what we are and what we ought to be. Like theosis. What we understand by theosis. Right? Taken up, it's often defined as taken up into the life of God. But it's theosis. The central definition of theosis is adoption. We're adopted. Where the being of God overlaps our being. And circles and embraces us at the incarnation. Jesus Christ is both the priest and the sacrifice. He's the offerer and the offering who offers himself. Jesus Christ stands in the plight of the destitute, diseased, damned and dying humanity and makes their plight his own. Taking our fallen and sinful humanity and assuming it into himself. That's really the heart of what the unassumed is the unhealed means. Is that he takes everything into himself so that he can fill the gap between what we are and what we ought to be. Taking us to where we ought to be. Wrapped in the loving kind loving goodwill of the Father, Son and Spirit. What they share with each other, they so desire to share with us. But as this theology was being developed through the first few centuries of the church, almost immediately alongside it, uh, uh, as this... um, theology uh, of union was being developed uh, other ideas began to creep in that undermine uh, the, this theology of union as far back as the second century and Tertullian laid down ideas that implied the very being of Jesus was not in line with the being of the father though he himself would have rejected Arianism but he started to insert some dualist ideas that now perhaps Jesus is not exactly like the Father. Cracks appeared between the act of Jesus and the being of God. So what Jesus said and what he did uh, was not quite the same as the Father. The Father is something different. He's more like the, the Caesar God. Now, as this wedge appeared, it is the vague ideas that started to creep in. Now, it's man's or humanity's attempt to be like God and determine what God can and cannot do and what he must and must not be. There's always that endeavour by, by ordinary human beings thinking they know better than what God has presented himself to us in Jesus Christ. God came to us as Jesus Christ. And so for every point of the Christian doctrine must begin and end with Jesus Christ. Now the problem is with poor old Augustine being um, a Neoplatonist Uh, converted to Christianity and he took what he thought was the best of Platonic teachings and Christianity and tried to meld the two together. Uh, And he took a hold of Tertullian's ideas and establishing divisions and dualisms between the sensible and intelligible worlds. Now there were divisions between heaven and hell or between... um, uh, the matter and uh, between the worldly and the spiritual, you know, what we've been taught in our churches, where we uh, divide um, the flesh and the spirit, heaven and earth. He just started to um, bring in these sorts of dualisms. Mm. So again, it is this is really when 
um, man start to become the measure of what is right and wrong according to all these terms that I've described before that um, I start to get a hold of you know, um, what rightness, rightness, righteousness should be according to um, what they determine to be right and wrong and the right thing for God to do they determined the right thing to do was to save us right. that's according to the gospel they tried to develop other ideas of what was right and wrong according to see the God and the dualist world views really it was the beginning of this uh, uh, the idea of limited atonement creeping in because Augustine really laid down the foundation for the doctrine of uh, predestination that was picked up by the Reformation and expanded by uh, John Calvin and then it was picked up by the Calvinists at the uh, Synod of Dort where they laid down the five points of Calvinism. It really began back when Augustine um, I suppose strengthened uh, Tertullian's ideas of um, you know, perhaps Jesus is not quite of the same being as the Father. As the cracks in the theology of union began to deepen, the relationship between the Father and the Son began to widen. There started to be a wedge and a gulf between the two. Right. According to the worldview, the incarnation was impossible. It cannot happen. How can something so pure right, have anything to do with matter which was regarded as evil? Right. So if God was going to come to us in the form of a person uh, and the Christian gospel has made this claim that this has happened, then we're going to have a few problems. Yeah, the spirit could not engage with evil matter and this includes our humanity. Uh, so this more and more problems start to appear as the, um, the worldview start to get a foothold in Christianity. Questions had to be answered. Therefore, the question of Jesus' humanity became the central issue of concern. Whereas in the Nicene theology, it wasn't a question at all as to who Jesus was and how Jesus came to us and the fact that he became a human being like every other human being and took on all our darkness, disease and depravity into himself. That was not a problem with the Nicene theologians. But as the worldview started to get a foothold, they had questions that they wanted to answer. And that's really how the, um, the Latin heresy started to come in. Worldview explanations attempt to explain the issue of the humanity-divinity problem. It was a problem to them. So they tried to reshape the Christian message that would fit in with their idea of sin defined as separation from God. So they wanted to marry the two together. Jesus, this was their answer. Jesus assumed a sinless pre-fall humanity. Not our humanity, but a humanity that was of the same condition of Adam before the fall. This has sent you know short circuits <laughs> through the through Hebrew theology because they have a different idea of what the human condition was like before the fall uh, they, they said if humanity was going to fall uh, there must have been something in their nature that would make them fall there must have been a fault there already that would lead them to believe, perhaps, that God was holding out on them. The doctrine, now, because Jesus is uh, 
regarded now as having a sinless humanity, then there came the problem of Mary. So they invented the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception right, to accommodate the sinless humanity of Jesus. But when you look at the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew, right, his genealogy highlights some pretty sus characters through history. You know, lots of you know, questionable characters. And Jesus was born into that and he made those generations his own. All these suspect characters of the past. He made them his own. But no, the worldview ignored all that and they wanted to, uh, to maintain their idea of sin as defined as separation from God and this is the idea that came up with. A human invention. Uh, that does not tie in with the theology of union of the Nicene era. They'd be horrified at seeing something like this. As a result, the person and work of Jesus no longer touches us. The gulf is widened between Jesus and the Father and us. Okay. Jesus becomes an example of an exemplary life and if we're going to get into heaven when we die then we need to follow in his footsteps and live like him so we have suddenly this step stairway to heaven you know, sometimes we Manage, feel like we're managing to walk like Jesus and the next day we fail so we have to get down on the knees and grovel and you know, win approval from God again and then when we think we've won approval from God again then we may get up another step and another step and so on. So we get on the religious treadmill of not ever being sure that we've actually quite made it and that's a very self-destructive way of living his death pays for the penalty of our sin but not the root of our alienation it is left untouched so we, it's up to us to work out our salvation the divine mind replaces the fallen mind which is Apollinarianism and what he believes is that you know, rightly thought that um, the mind is the root of the sin and it's a result of why we behave the way we do. And so um, in the incarnation he thought, logically thought, well Jesus cannot have adopted the divine mind, um, a sinful mind, uh, he must have adopted the divine mind. So the divine, the sinful mind was replaced by the divine mind. So this was all helped answer the problem, the worldview problem, their idea of sin defined as separation. Jesus had a divine and human nature. Uh, Nestorianism. And what this meant is that... Um, at the cross, it was not the divine nature that died, it was the human nature that died. So there was a, a division between the two natures. Uh, and so they also believe that divinity doesn't have emotions. That how could the divine suffer? So they tried to find a way of separating the two and all of these factors played a huge part in the rather messy theology that we have today in the church today because it's a lot of the, these ideas that have been subtly introduced into the church. Now, in other words, room is now made for all the heresies to gain a foothold in the theology 
such as Arianism. There's many examples of Arianism today. If you say that sin is defined as separation from God, you're articulating an Arian belief, which was condemned at the Nicene Council of 325 AD. And, all, uh, and it, it was a, um, the battle that was raging through that area. And we have other um, um, heresies such as Docetism um, and all those other ones which I've listed there. In one way or another you have different facets of Christianity that have uh, adopted their ideas. Some have perhaps taken a little bit from all these heresies and have introduced them into the Christian gospel and that's why we have so many divisions within, within the church because once this idea of uh, the definition of sin defined as separation gets a foothold then man has to answer the problems that arise in the gospel message and by and large we've accepted a lot of it I know I accepted a lot of it. All of these heresies are trying to address the worldly concern, as I said, of sin defined as separation from God. Now, God in union with humanity in Jesus Christ, I just want to just touch base with the truth before we go on what we have here this circle represents the humanity of Jesus Christ so when we look at the humanity of Jesus Christ what we're looking at within the humanity is the Father, Son, Spirit their beings are overlapped even in the humanity of Jesus right, and overlap with our fallen humanity so Within Jesus Christ, we have the doctrine of God. Jesus defines the doctrine of God. He defines salvation. Judgment. Jesus is the judgment of God. And when we look at it that way, when we look at judgment, the judgment of God, when we look to Jesus, all we can see is a good judgment. Right. Judgment is rendered from the Greek word krisis, right, which really means decision. So when we look to Jesus Christ, we see that as the good decision of God. That Jesus Christ has to have enormous weight and influence in how we understand all these typical Greek meanings. Jesus defines redemption. Carbart describes Jesus as God and humanity together. That's what Jesus represents. You cannot look at any human being apart from Jesus and Jesus is defined as God and humanity together. When you look at any human being, you've got to look at them from the perspective of Jesus Christ. God and humanity together. Atonement. Jesus embodies atonement. God come to us as man, not in a man, as man. At one mint. That's literally what atonement means. At one mint. Between God and fallen humanity. Which is reconciliation. Jesus Christ embodies reconciliation. Sanctification. Jesus Christ embodies sanctification. Now, the Latin heresy, what they've done is they've pushed the Father God, and Jesus in this humanity, apart. All right. In doing so, right, as they're pushing them apart, What we have is these terms, everything we know, the fallen humanity, doctrine of God, judgment, redemption and so on, 
uh, have been ripped away from Jesus. All right? When we rip them away from Jesus, how are they defined now? Who takes responsibility in explaining what these terms mean? Uh, the ontological connection between the Father, Son and our fallen humanity and the work of God in Jesus is severed. Ontology is the nature of the being. So the beings of the Father, Son and our fallen humanity have been severed. There's no longer an overlapping of beings. Uh, there's no longer an overlapping of the mind of God with the mind of humanity. Uh, there's no longer an, an overlapping of our humanity with Jesus. That's been severed. All right. So we have a problem with these definitions now. Who defines all these terms? Who takes responsibility for these terms? We have the Father God and Jesus' sinless humanity. They've been pushed apart. All right whereby we no longer see the Father in Jesus. We have this other God that we should be afraid of behind the back of Jesus. Fallen humanity, all those terms now, I'll put that in the red because it's, it's alarming. What happens now? Who takes over this? The church. So we have the church step in and they take responsibility uh, in regard to revelation, the doctrine of God, judgment, redemption, atonement, reconciliation, and sanctification. So they bring their worldview in, they bring their idea of what God, who God must be and who he must not be and what he can and can't do. The Caesar God, I call him. Right. And they decide on how these terms will be defined. Jesus is left out of the picture. They bring in uh, um, theories of atonement, a theory of atonement, what must have happened in the atonement, and they try to explain the atonement. Right. When at the end of the day, the atonement cannot be explained. It's a mystery what happens in the atonement. The veil of the atonement is Jesus' humanity. We can't open his humanity and look inside and see atonement happening. Happening. It's even veiled behind. The angels don't even know what's going on. It's a mystery that happens. What we see is uh, Jesus in the incarnation through his whole life, his crucifixion and his resurrection. We see that. That's as much as we see. We see in the resurrection, we see a vindication of the whole life of Jesus. Right. So the Father God and Jesus sinless humanity push apart the Catholic Church administer healing grace through the sacraments so they actually take possession take a hold of the concerns of the saving welfare of the congregation the Protestant Church it's in its prayer followed by walking in the exemplary life of Jesus. Now repent, give your life to God. How are we going for time? Five minutes. Yep. So what we have here with the Father and Jesus and pushed apart where we don't actually see the face of the Father in Jesus uh, is, is this, I suppose, a vacuum and this vacuum has been filled by the, um, what, the, what humanity has decided for themselves to, to be the measure of what is right and wrong. Uh, and when we get involved in the things of God and that's where our pride comes in, that's where um, we have problems um, like we have in the, uh, right in the church today. We leave ourselves wide open for abuse, manipulation. We often have to answer to the judgment, 
judgments of other human beings in regard to our Christian walk. We often get measured by other people in the church. Now, if things are going bad for you, right, then that might reflect poor faith. If things are going well for you, right, that might reflect that you're having a close walk with God. Right, that really is all points back to the Latin heresy. Uh, and this this is something that I believe that we all need to be aware of. If we can understand a little of what this Latin heresy is about, then we are on the way to understanding the gospel is fully contained in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So what we have in Jesus Christ is, I don't know if you've ever seen that uh, show, Undercover Boss. Any of you seen that show? Right. What we have is a chief executive of a company and what he would do is he will get up from out of his seat uh, and he'll change his looks um, and he'll become involved with his workers and he'll be, he comes in um, perhaps um, guys as somebody who has lost their job and is trying to look for a new career opportunity and he goes into his company, he's on a uh, production line, and he throws himself at the mercy of his co-workers. Uh, and some of them, they find out all sorts of things about themselves, but uh, what they find is that um, they get a hard time from their fellow workers, even though they own the, co- uh, the company. Right? And in very much a similar way, what Jesus Christ has done is he's stepped down from where he is from beside the Father and he has come to us uh, and he has um, thrown himself at the mercy of fellow human beings and he's thrown himself at the mercy of death. He becomes a servant to death. So if we um, ignore that fact that Jesus came to us as uh, of the same being as the Father, uh, as uh, come to us with the face of the Father, then we are presented with all sorts of problems. If we fail to ignore that uh, the heart and soul of Christian theology is based on the union between the Father, Son and Spirit and uh, with our fallen humanity, then we run into all sorts of problems as I've just described. So it's vitally important. And, And I believe it is this that has had enormous weight on how the modern translations have been brought to us. In, in one way or another it's had uh, adopted uh, little bits or some of these ideas have been brought into the mind of the translator and we have ended up with something that is far removed from what the Nicene theologians uh, tried to present to the known world at the time. I think on that note we'll take a break. Three scenes in this garment, one garment I wear. Three leaves on the shamrock from the soil that I tear. Three joints in my finger, one finger is there. Blessed Father, Son, Spirit, yet one God I serve.